This is part three of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please listen with an open mind. Thank you for listening. Various monsters, such as a horned creature or a sphinx. Why should the observation of a flying disc be represented in the context of an obviously magical ceremony that does not appear to have any traditional characteristic of Phoenician religion? We are told, for instance, that the Phoenicians held the same view as the Hebrews concerning the survival of the soul, that they buried their dead with great care, and that their sacrificial ceremonies involved killing human beings in sacred prostitution. Why then is it that, if the seals are associated with spiritual or religious values, they depict nothing of this, but do instead show winged discs that appear to come from a star, contain strange beings who carry off earth animals, and emit lightning bolts? And why are the human assistants wearing special vestments with wings on them? Representation of flying discs in religion does not stop with the Phoenicians. The symbol is a basic one in the early Christian church, and it is consistently associated with the angels. Christian theology does not have much to say about the angels, just as official Muslim theology remains discreet about the jinn. Some rare documents, however, give details concerning the nature of these beings. According to Japanese researcher Wamatsumura, the religious Sophia, a written document commenting on the dogma of the Greek Orthodox Church preserved in the Leningrad National Library, describes the process of communication between God and the angels, how does the Lord guide his angel, if the angel cannot see the face of his Lord? An angel has a projection on the upper part of his eyes, where a sacred cloud rests. He has also a thing to receive sounds on his head. This thing makes noises as an angel receives an order where to go from his Lord. Then he quickly looks at the mirror in his hand, and he gets in the mirror something on which an instruction from God is given. I have not been able to verify directly the existence of this document and the accuracy of the translation, but it is consistent with a number of paintings, icons, and murals that depict contact between God and his messengers and contact between the messengers and men. Communication for a long time took place through pictorial representation rather than words, and it is not surprising to find few descriptions of such contact in written language. I am inclined to a literal, rather than purely symbolic, interpretation of the scenes depicted on the Phoenician amulets, and I am also tempted to accept as a working hypothesis that in times remote contact occurred between human consciousness and another consciousness, variously described as demonic, angelic, or simply alien. This would explain much of the symbolic power retained in our own time by the concept of signs in the sky. It would account for the fact that modern-day UFOs seem to present archaic as well as futuristic designs, as in the representation of the Arabic astrological sign for Venus on the object seen at Socorro, New Mexico, by Patrolman Lonnie Zamora, and it would also explain the fascination that people of all countries and races have always had for the strange entities from above. How constant these observations and visions have remained will be seen by comparing the Phoenician seal story with the following letter from a woman who saw a scorpion man. In our time, the case of the Oxford scorpion man a letter from a British woman begins, at the lecture by Jacques Vallée at the London A. Architects Association, on the 12th of December I was surprised by one of the slides of a Phoenician seal showing a winged sphere held up by two creatures which he described as scorpion men. Perhaps I have seen such a man myself. It was the summer of 1968, about 4 p.m. she was driving from London to a place near Stratford to visit friends for the weekend. She had a companion in the car with her. Just outside Oxford they both saw a shining disc in the sky. They slowed and then stopped to watch it as it darted and dodged. Another car stopped to watch it, too. Eventually it sank behind the trees. They resumed their trip but the really striking events took place after the disc had disappeared, during the drive between Burford and Stratford I had some startling, and to me, novel insights into what I can only describe as the nature of reality. They were connected in some way to this shining disc, and have had a profound effect on me, causing what is commonly known as a personality change. I won't try to explain what those insights were since almost all the religions of the world have tried to do this and have failed. In that afternoon I changed from an agnostic to a Gnostic, if that means anything at all. However, these insights hit me like bolts from the blue, as though from outside, one after the other. 
I've never had a similar experience since. The letter continues with a description of what the woman saw that evening after supper, a description that seems to come straight out of a John Fowles novel. The guests were in the sitting room, which had open French windows leading out onto the lawn, and the woman went over to the window to get a breath of fresh air. The weather, she wrote, was very hot and close. The light from the room shone in an arc of about 10 feet around the window. In that area I saw, as soon as I came to the window, a strange figure. My perception of it was heightened by the state of frozen panic it produced in me. It was for me without any doubt, a demon, or devil because of my western-oriented interpretation, I imagine, of the vision or creature or animal or man, or whatever it was I saw. Like the scorpion man, as well as Pan, it had dog or goat-like legs. It was covered in silky, downy fur, dark, and glinting in the light. It was unmistakably humanoid, and to my mind malevolent. It crouched, and stared, unblinkingly, at me with light, great green eyes that slanted upwards and had no pupils. The eyes shone and were by far the most frightening thing about it. It was, I think retrospectively, trying to communicate with me, but my panic interfered with any message I might have received. If it had stood to its full height it would have been about four to five feet tall. It had pointed ears and a long muzzle. It gave the impression of emaciation, its hands and fingers were as thin as sticks. Eventually, convinced that I was hallucinating, I went and sat down for a while, until the panic had subsided. Then I went to see if it was still there. It was, except that it had moved further into the shadows on the edge of the arc of light. I made sure I kept away from that door for the rest of the evening, and left the next day. I told no one. That it may have been connected with a shining disc I only realized when I saw that slide. I have other reports in my files of such forgotten observations that the witnesses only recollected when their memory was triggered by a slide, a book cover, or a lecture. The Beam of Light a major feature in all religious traditions involves a mysterious beam of light emanating from a point in the sky or from a cloud of peculiar shape and focused on a human being. This beam usually is interpreted as a sign of blessing which conveys information from a divine source. I am intrigued by this concept because it is a recurrent one in modern contact cases. Psychic experimenter Robert Monroe has described a similar phenomenon in his own investigations of out-of-body consciousness. On the night of September 9, 1960, as he was lying on his bed, Monroe says, in his book Out of the Body, I suddenly felt bathed in and transfixed by a very powerful beam that seemed to come from the north, about 30 degrees above the horizon. I was completely powerless, with no will of my own, and I felt as if I were in the presence of a very strong force, in personal contact with it. It had intelligence of a form beyond my comprehension, and it came directly, down the beam, into my head, and seemed to be searching every memory in my mind. I was truly frightened because I was powerless to do anything about this intrusion. On September 16th, at night, again from the verbatim notes of Robert Monroe, the same impersonal probing, the same power, from the same angle. However, this time I received the firm impression that I was inextricably bound by loyalty to this intelligent force, always had been and that I had a job to perform here on earth. I got the impression of huge pipes, so ancient they were covered with undergrowth and rust. Something like oil was passing through them, but it was much higher in energy than oil, and vitally needed and valuable elsewhere, assumption, not on this material planet. On September 30th, the same pattern, they seemed to soar up into the sky, while I called after them, pleading, then I was sure that their mentality and intelligence were far beyond my understanding. It is an impersonal, cold intelligence, with none of the emotions of love or compassion which we respect so much, yet this may be the omnipotence we call God. Visits such as these in mankind's past could well have been the basis for all of our religious beliefs, and our knowledge today could provide no better answer than we could a thousand years past. By this time, it was getting light, and I sat down and cried great deep sobs such as I have never cried before, because then I knew without any qualification of future hope of change that the God of my childhood, of the churches, of religion throughout the world was not as we worshipped him to be, that for the rest of my life, I would suffer the loss of this illusion. The Case of the Tranquilizing Light 
a case that took place in March 1958, and which was later reported in the pages of the Flying Saucer Review by French investigator Joel Mesnard, provides an opportunity to verify again the strange properties of the lights associated with the UFO phenomenon in modern as in ancient times. The witness here is a 28-year-old French legionnaire who was on sentry duty at the Algerian camp of Bouamama, in the desert south of Constantine. Shortly after 12.30 a.m., this man heard a whistling noise that seemed to be coming from the sky, and as he looked up he saw a very large object, about 1,000 feet in diameter, coming down some 150 feet away from him. The most remarkable thing about this object, however, was not its enormous size but the intense conical beam of emerald green light that came down from its underside. The recollections of the legionnaire beyond this point are vague and, by his own admission, may not correspond to reality. Instead of either firing his gun to alert others or picking up the field telephone to call his superiors, he remained staring at the object for over three quarters of an hour. According to this man, as interviewed by Joel Mesnard, the pale green and emerald colors were the most beautiful, relaxing, and fascinating colors he had ever seen. The object departed in the most classical way, first the whistling noise, then the rising to an altitude of about 300 feet, and finally the climb at tremendous speed toward the northwest. As the object left and the man returned to full awareness, the happy, ecstatic feeling he had experienced was replaced by sadness. He picked up the telephone and reported what he had seen to his superiors. They initially thought that the experience was a hallucination due to stress, but it is to the credit of the French military that a thorough investigation was pursued. Instead of sweeping the case under the rug, and the French Legion in Algeria had more pressing problems at that time than investigating UFO landings, the officers went to the site, examined it carefully, found no physical evidence, resumed their questioning of the witness, and, as he kept insisting on the veracity of the event and they had no reason to doubt his truthfulness, they sent him to Paris for a more detailed examination. In Paris he was kept under observation for one week at the Val de Grace Military Hospital. An electroencephalogram revealed nothing unusual. The medical staff concluded that he was in a state of good mental and physical health and was not suffering from the strain of war in any unusual way. Mr. Mesnard met the witness in May 1970. The legionnaire had returned to civilian life and impressed the investigator with his practical, down-to-earth sense. He had been looking for no publicity whatsoever and was even reluctant to discuss his experience. When he did so, he answered questions in a straight, matter-of-fact way. He has had no illness of any kind since the day of the sighting, no new experience of an unusual type, and he recalls the extremely peaceful state induced by the presence of the object. It was like time running very slowly. It was like being in another world. Is the mechanism of UFO apparitions, then, an invariant in all cultures? Are we faced here with another reality that transcends our limited notions of space and time? I see no better hypothesis at this point of our knowledge of UFO phenomena. Certainly the space visitor's hypothesis fails to explain adequately the ancient symbolism. We do not have a simple series of incidents that could be explained as an encounter with space travelers who might have spotted the Earth and explored it casually on their way to another cosmic destination. Instead, we have a pattern of manifestations, opening the gates to a spiritual level, pointing a way to a different consciousness, and producing irrational, absurd events in their wake. The Phoenician amulets, the close encounters with occupants in our time, the ancient beam from heaven, and the focus light from UFOs seem to imply a technology capable of both physical manifestation and psychic effects, a technology that strikes deep at the collective consciousness, confusing us, molding us, as perhaps it confused and molded human civilizations in antiquity. Look but do not touch. It was a great wonder, a sign in heaven indeed, the marvelous airship that flew over the United States in the spring of 1897. And the rediscovery of the remarkable wave of reports it generated has provided a crucial missing link between the apparitions of older days and modern saucer stories, thanks to researchers such as Donald Hanlon, Jerome Clark, and Lucius Farish. The result of their investigations is astonishing. In California, in November 1896, hundreds of residents of the San Francisco area saw a large, elongated, 
dark object that carried brilliant searchlights and was capable of flying against the wind. Between January and March 1897, it vanished entirely. And suddenly a staggering number of observations of an identical object were made in the Midwest. A witness named Alexander Hamilton described it, a craft with turbine wheels and a glass section with strange beings aboard looking down, a description not unlike that given by Barney and Betty Hill. In March, an object of even stranger appearance was seen by Robert Hibbard, a farmer living 15 miles north of Sioux City, Iowa. Hibbard not only saw the airship, but an anchor hanging from a rope attached to the mysterious craft caught his clothes and dragged him several dozen feet, until he fell back to earth. Presenting in an orderly fashion all the accounts of that period would itself fill a book. My object here is only to review the most detailed observations of the behavior of the airship's occupants on the ground. But first, how did the object behave? It maneuvered very much in the way UFOs are said to maneuver, except that airships were never seen flying in formation or performing aerial dances. Usually, an airship flew rather slowly and majestically, of course, such an object in 1897 ran no risk of being pursued, except in a few close proximity cases when it was reported to depart as a shot out of a gun. Another difference from modern UFOs lies in the fact that its leisurely trajectory often took it over large urban areas. Omaha, Milwaukee, Chicago, and other cities were thus visited, each time, large crowds gathered to watch the object. Otherwise, the airship exhibited all the typical activities of UFOs, hovering, dropping probes, on Newton, Iowa, on April 10th, for example, changing course abruptly, changing altitude at great speed, circling, landing and taking off, sweeping the countryside with powerful light beams. The occupants of the airship were as variously described as our UFO operators. Several reports could be interpreted to mean that dwarfs were among them, but it was not stated in so many words by witnesses. Alexander Hamilton says that the beings were the strangest he had ever seen and that he did not care to see them again. The UFO's operators who engaged in discussion with human witnesses were indistinguishable from the average American population of the time. This, for instance, is the experience related by Captain James Houghton, described in the Arkansas Gazette as the well-known Iron Mountain Railroad conductor. I had gone down to Texarkana to bring back a special, and knowing that I would have some eight to ten hours to spend in Texarkana, I went to Homan, Arkansas, to do a little hunting. It was three o'clock in the afternoon when I reached that place. The spot was good, and before I knew it, it was after six o'clock when I started to make my way back toward the railroad station. As I was tramping through the bush my attention was attracted by a familiar sound, a sound for all the world like the working of an air pump on a locomotive. I went at once in the direction of the sound, and there in an open space of some five or six acres, I saw the object making the noise. To say that I was astonished would but feebly express my feelings. I decided at once that this was the famous airship seen by so many people about the country. There was a medium-sized looking man aboard and I noticed that he was wearing smoked glasses. He was tinkering around what seemed to be the back end of the ship, and as I approached I was too dumbfounded to speak. He looked at me in surprise, and said, Good day, sir, good day. I asked, Is this the airship? And he replied, Yes, sir, whereupon three or four other men came out of what was apparently the keel of the ship. A close examination showed that the keel was divided into two parts, terminating in front like the sharp of a knife-like edge, while the side of the ship bulged gradually toward the middle, and then receded. There were three large wheels upon each side made of some bending metal and arranged so that they became concave as they moved forward. I beg your pardon, sir, I said, the noise sounds a great deal like a Westinghouse air brake. Perhaps it does, my friend, we are using condensed air and airplanes, but you will know more later on. All ready, sir, someone called out, when the party all disappeared below. I observed that the just in front of each wheel a two-inch tube began to spurt air on the wheels and they commenced revolving. The ship gradually arose with a hissing sound. The airplanes suddenly sprang forward, turning their sharp and skyward, then the rudders at the end of the ship began to veer to one side and the wheel revolved so fast that one could scarcely see the blades. In less time than it takes to tell you, 
the ship had gone out of sight. Captain Houdin adds that he could discover no bell or bell rope about the ship and was greatly shocked by this detail, since he thought every well-regulated air locomotive should have one. He left a detailed drawing of the machine. We next look at the testimony of Constable Sumter and Deputy Sheriff McLemore, of Hot Springs, Arkansas, while riding northwest from the city on the night of May 6, 1897, we noticed a brilliant light high in the heavens. Suddenly it disappeared and we said nothing about it, as we were looking for parties and did not want to make any noise. After riding four or five miles around through the hills we again saw the light, which now appeared to be much nearer the earth. We stopped our horses and watched it coming down, until all at once it disappeared behind another hill. We rode on about half a mile, when our horses refused to go further. About a hundred yards distant we saw two persons moving around with lights. Drawing our Winchesters, for we were now thoroughly aroused to the importance of the situation, we demanded, who is that, and what are you doing? A man with a long dark beard came forth with a lantern in his hand, and on being informed who we were proceeded to tell us that he and the others, a young man and a woman, were traveling through the country in an airship. We could plainly distinguish the outlines of the vessel, which was cigar-shaped and about sixty feet long, and looking just like the cuts that have appeared in the papers recently. It was dark and raining and the young man was filling a big sack with water about thirty yards away, and the woman was particular to keep back in the dark. She was holding an umbrella over her head. The man with the whiskers invited us to take a ride, saying that he could take us where it was not raining. We told him we believed we preferred to get wet. Asking the man why the brilliant light was turned on and off so much, he replied that the light was so powerful that it consumed a great deal of his motive power. He said he would like to stop off in hot springs for a few days and take the hot baths, but his time was limited and he could not. He said they were going to wind up at Nashville, after thoroughly seeing the country. Being in a hurry we left and upon our return, about forty minutes later, nothing was to be seen. We did not hear or see the airship when it departed. In the Chicago Chronicle of April 13, 1897, appeared the following, under the headline airship seen in Iowa, Fontenelle, Iowa, April 12. The airship was seen here at 8.30 tonight, and was viewed by the whole population. It came from the southeast, and was not over 200 feet above the treetops and moved very slowly, not to exceed 10 miles an hour. The machine could be plainly seen, and is described as being 60 feet in length, and the vibration of the wings could be plainly seen. It carried the usual colored lights, and the working of the machinery could be heard, as also could the strains of music, as from an orchestra. It was hailed, but passed on to the north, seeming to increase its speed, and disappeared. There is no doubt in Fontenelle that it was the real thing, and is testified to by the most prominent citizens. Here the airship, which had appeared to Captain Houdin as a typically mechanical contraption, takes on a more fairy-like appearance. The parallel becomes even more striking in the following report, as pointed out by researcher Donald Hanlon. It is extracted from the April 28th edition of the Houston Daily Post, Merkle, Texas, April 26. Some parties returning from church last night noticed a heavy object dragging along with a rope attached. They followed it until... In crossing the railroad, it caught on a rail. On looking up they saw what they supposed was the airship. It was not near enough to get an idea of the dimensions. A light could be seen protruding several windows, one bright light in front like the headlight of a locomotive. After some ten minutes, a man was seen descending the rope. He came near enough to be plainly seen. He wore a light blue sailor suit and was small in size. He stopped when he discovered parties at the anchor, and cut the rope below him and sailed off in a northeast direction. The anchor is now on exhibition at the blacksmith shop of Elliot and Miller and is attracting the attention of hundreds of people. This sounds much too familiar to be taken lightly, comments Hanlon, who reminds us of the Sioux City incident, when Robert Hibbard was dragged by an anchor hanging from an airship, and of Drake's and Wilkins' account of two incidents that took place about 1211 AD or earlier. According to the Irish story, there happened in the borough of Cloira, one Sunday, while the people were at Mass, a marvel. In this town is a church dedicated to St. Kynaris. It befell that an anchor was dropped from the sky, with a rope attached to it, 
and one of the flukes caught in the arch above the church door. The people rushed out of the church and saw in the sky a ship with men on board, floating before the anchor cable, and they saw a man leap overboard and jump down to the anchor, as if to release it. He looked as if he were swimming in water. The folk rushed up and tried to seize him, but the bishop forbade the people to hold the man, for it might kill him, he said. The man was freed, and hurried up to the ship, where the crew cut the rope and the ship sailed out of sight. But the anchor is in the church, and has been there ever since, as a testimony. In Gervis of Tilbury's Otis Imperialia, a similar account is related as having taken place in Gravesend, Kent, England. An anchor from a cloud ship caught in a mound of stones in the churchyard. The people heard voices from above, and the rope was moved as if to free the anchor, to no avail. A man was then seen to slide down the rope and cut it. In one account, he then climbed back aboard the ship, in another, he died of suffocation. The Houston Post of April 22, 1897, has a further report, Rockland, Mr. John M. Barkley, living near this place, reports that last night about 11 o'clock, after having retired, he heard his dog barking furiously, together with a whining noise. He went to the door to ascertain the trouble and saw something, he says, that made his eyes bulge out and but for the fact that he had been reading of an airship that was supposed to have been in or over Texas, he would have taken to the woods. It was a peculiar shaped body, with an oblong shape, with wings and side attachments of various sizes and shapes. There were brilliant lights, which appeared much brighter than electric lights. When he first saw it, he seemed perfectly stationary about five yards from the ground. It circled a few times and gradually descended to the ground in a pasture adjacent to his house. He took his Winchester and went down to investigate. As soon as the ship, or whatever it might be, alighted the lights went out. The night was bright enough for a man to be distinguished several yards, and when within about thirty yards of the ship he was met by an ordinary mortal, who requested him to lay his gun aside as no harm was intended whereupon the following conversation ensued. Mr. Barclay inquired, Who are you and what do you want? Never mind about my name, call it Smith. I want some lubricating oil and a couple of cold chisels if you can get them, and some bluestone. I suppose the sawmill hard by has the two former articles and the telegraph operator has the bluestone. Here is a ten dollar bill, take it and get us these articles and keep the change for your trouble. Mr. Barclay said, what have you got down there? Let me go and see it. He who wanted to be called Smith said, No, we cannot permit you to approach any nearer, but do as we request you and your kindness will be appreciated, and we will call you some future day and reciprocate your kindness by taking you on a trip. Mr. Barclay went and procured the oil and cold chisels, but could not get the bluestone. They had no change and Mr. Barclay tendered him the ten dollar bill, but same was refused. The man shook hands with him and thanked him cordially and asked that he not follow him to the vessel. As he left Mr. Barclay called him and asked where he was from and where he was going. He replied, from anywhere, but we will be in Greece day after tomorrow. He got on board, when there was again the whirling noise, and the thing was gone, as Mr. Barclay expresses it, like a shot out of a gun. Mr. Barclay is perfectly reliable. The same night, half an hour later, According to the Houston Post of April 26 and reported independently, Josseron, considerable excitement prevails at this writing in this usually quiet village of Jesse Rand, caused by a visit of the noted airship, which has been at so many points of late. Mr. Frank Nichols, a prominent farmer living about two miles east of here, and a man of unquestioned veracity, was awakened night before last near the hour of twelve by whirring noise similar to that made by machinery. Upon looking out he was startled upon beholding brilliant light streaming from a ponderous vessel of strange proportions, which rested upon the ground in his cornfield. The landing at Eagle River. It was an unusual day in 1961 for the Food and Drug Laboratory of the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, when the Air Force requested an analysis of a piece of wheat cake that had been cooked. Aboard a flying saucer, the human being who had obtained the cake was Joe Simonton, a 60-year-old chicken farmer who lived alone in a small house in the vicinity of Eagle River, Wisconsin. He was given three cakes, ate one of them, and thought it tasted like cardboard. 
The Air Force put it more scientifically, the cake was composed of hydrogenated fat, starch, buckwheat hulls, soya bean hulls, wheat bran. Bacteria and radiation readings were normal for this material. Chemical, infrared and other destructive type tests were run on this material. The Food and Drug Laboratory of the U.S. Department of Health, Education and Welfare concluded that the material was an ordinary pancake of terrestrial origin. Where did it come from? The reader will have to decide for himself what he chooses to believe after reading this chapter. It includes the Eagle River incident because this is a first-hand account, given by a man of absolute sincerity. Speaking for the U.S. Air Force, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who investigated the case along with Major Robert Friend and an officer from Sawyer AAS Force Base, stated, There is no question that Mr. Simonton felt that his contact had been a real experience. The time was approximately 11 a.m. on April 18, 1961, when Joe Simonton was attracted outside by a peculiar noise similar to knobby tires on a wet pavement. Stepping into his yard, he faced a silvery saucer-shaped object, brighter than chrome, which appeared to be hovering close to the ground without actually touching it. The object was about 12 feet high and 30 feet in diameter. A hatch opened about 5 feet from the ground, and Simonton saw three men inside the machine. One was dressed in a black two-piece suit. The occupants were about five feet tall. Smooth-shaven, they appeared to resemble Italians. They had dark hair and skin and wore outfits with turtleneck tops and knit helmets. One of the men held up a jug apparently made of the same material as the saucer. His motioning to Joe Simonton seemed to indicate that he needed water. Simonton took the jug, went inside the house, and filled it. As he returned, he saw that one of the men inside the saucer was frying food on a flameless grill of some sort. The interior of the ship was black, the color of wrought iron. Simonton saw several instrument panels and heard a slow whining sound, similar to the hum of a generator. When he made a motion indicating he was interested in the food one of the men, who was also dressed in black but with a narrow red trim along the trousers, handed him three cookies, about three inches in diameter and perforated with small holes. The whole affair lasted about five minutes. Finally, the man closest to the witness attached a kind of belt to a hook in his clothing and closed the hatch in such a way that Simonton could scarcely detect its outline. Then the object rose about 20 feet from the ground before taking off straight south, causing a blast of air that bent some nearby pine trees. Along the edge of the saucer, the witness recalls, were exhaust pipes six or seven inches in diameter. The hatch was about six feet high and thirty inches wide, and, although the object has always been described as a saucer, its actual shape was that of two inverted bowls. When two deputies sent by Sheriff Schroeder, who had known Simonton for fourteen years, arrived on the scene, they could not find any corroborative evidence. The sheriff stated that the witness obviously believed the truth of what he was saying and talked very sensibly about the incident. Food from Fairyland The Eagle River case has never been solved. The Air Force believes that Joe Simonton, who lived alone, had a sudden dream while he was awake and inserted his dream into the continuum of events around him of which he was conscious. I understand several psychologists in Dayton, Ohio, are quite satisfied with this explanation. So were most serious amateur ufologists of the time. Alas! Ufology, like psychology, has become such a narrow field of specialization that the experts have no time for general culture. They are so busy rationalizing the dreams of other people that they themselves do not dream anymore, nor do they read fairy tales. If they did, they would perhaps take a much closer look at Joe Simonton and his pancakes. They would know about the gentry and the food from fairyland, in 1909, an American researcher named Walter Evans Wentz, who wrote a thesis on Celtic traditions in Brittany, devoted much time to the gathering of folk tales about supernatural beings, their habits, their contacts with men, and their food. In his book The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, for example, he gives the story of Pat Feeney, an Irishman of whom we know only that he was well off before the hard times, meaning perhaps the famine of 1846 to 1847. One day a little woman came to his house and asked for some oatmeal, Patty had so little that he was ashamed to offer it, so he offered her some potatoes instead, but she wanted oatmeal, 
and then he gave her all that he had. She told him to place it back in the bin till she should return for it. This he did, and the next morning the bin was overflowing with oatmeal. The woman was one of the gentry. It is unfortunate that Patty did not save this valuable evidence for the benefit of the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare's Food and Drug Lab. Perhaps the lab would have explained this miracle of the multiplication of the oatmeal, along with other peculiar properties of fairy food, for it is well known in Ireland that if you are taken away by the gentry, you must never taste food in their palace. Otherwise, you never come back, you become one of them. It is interesting that the analysis performed for the Air Force did not mention the presence of salt in the pancakes given to Simonton. Indeed, Evans Wentz was told by an Irishman who was quite familiar with the gentry that they never taste anything salt, but eat fresh meat and drink pure water. Pure water is what the saucer men took from Simonton. The question of food in one of the points most frequently treated in the traditional literature of the Celtic legends, along with the documented stories of babies kidnapped by the elves and of the terrestrial animals they hunt and take away. Before we study this abundant material, however, we should supply some background information about the mysterious folks the Irish call the gentry and the Scots call the good people, Slee Maith. The gentry are a fine large race who live out on the sea and in the mountains, and they are all very good neighbors. The bad ones are not the gentry at all, they are the fallen angels and they live in the woods and the sea, says one of Evans Wentz's informers. Patrick Water gives this description of one of the beings, a crowd of boys out in the fields one day saw a fairy man with a red cap. Except for his height he was like any other man. He was about three and a half feet tall. The boys surrounded him, but he made such a sputtering talk they let him go. And he disappeared as he walked away in the direction of the old fort. There were few places where one could still see such creatures, even in Great Britain or France, after 1850. All the storytellers, all the popular almanacs, agree that as civilization advanced the little folks became increasingly shy. A few untouched places recommended by Evans Wentz, however, are the Yosemite Valley in California and the Ben Bulban Country and Ross Point in County Sligo, Ireland. Dublin seers are known to have made many trips to Ben Bulban, a famous mountain honeycombed with curious grottos. At the very foot of the mountain, as the heavy white fog banks hung over Ben Bulban and its neighbors, Evans once was told, the following incident occurred, when I was a young man I often used to go out in the mountains over there to fish for trout or to hunt. And it was in January on a cold, dry day while carrying my gun that I and a friend with me as we were walking around Ben Bulban saw one of the gentry for the first time. This one was dressed in blue with a headdress adorned with what seemed to be frills. When he came upon us, he said to me in a sweet and silvery voice, The seldom you come to this mountain the better, mister, a young lady here wants to take you away. Then he told us not to fire our guns, because the gentry dislike being disturbed by the noise. And he seemed to be like a soldier of the gentry on guard. As we were leaving the mountain, he told us not to look back and we didn't. Evans Wentz then asked for a description of the gentry, and was told the following, The folk are the grandest I have ever seen. They are far superior to us and that is why they call themselves the gentry. They are not a working class, but a military aristocratic class, tall and noble appearing. They are a distinct race between our race and that of spirits, as they have told me. Their qualifications are tremendous, we could cut off half the human race, but would not, they said for we are expecting salvation. And I knew a man three or four years ago whom they struck down with paralysis. Their sight is so penetrating that I think they could see through the earth. They have a silvery voice, quick and sweet. The gentry live inside the mountains in beautiful castles, and there are a good many branches of them in other countries, and especially in Ireland. Some live in the Wicklow Mountains near Dublin. Like armies they have their stations and move from one to another. My guide and informer said to me once, I command a regiment. They travel greatly, and they can appear in Paris, Marseille, Naples, Genoa, Turin or Dublin, like ordinary people, and even in crowds. They love especially Spain, southern France, and the south of Europe. The gentry take a great interest in the affairs of men and they always stand for justice and right. Sometimes they fight among themselves. 
They take young and intelligent people who are interesting. They take the whole body and soul, transmuting the body to a body like their own. I asked them once if they ever died and they said, No, we are always kept young. Once they take you and you taste food in their palace you cannot come back. They never taste anything salt, but eat fresh meat and drink pure water. They marry and have children. And one of them could marry a good and pure mortal. They are able to appear in different forms. One once appeared to me and seemed only four feet high, and stoutly built. He said, I am bigger than I appear to you now. We can make the old young, the big small, the small big. The cakes given to Joe Simonton were composed of, among other things, buckwheat hulls. And buckwheat is closely associated with legends of Brittany, one of the most conservative Celtic areas. In that region of France, belief in fairies, fees, is still widespread, although Evans Wentz and Paul Sibillet had great difficulty, about 1900, finding Bretons who said that they had seen fees. One of the peculiarities of Breton traditional legend is the association of the fees or corrigans with a race of beings named Fians. Once upon a time a black cow belonging to little cave-dwelling Fians ruined the buckwheat field of a poor woman, who bitterly complained about the damage. The Fians made a deal with her, they would see to it that she should never run out of buckwheat cakes, provided she kept her mouth shut. And indeed she and her family discovered that their supply of cakes was inexhaustible. Alas! One day the woman gave some of the cake to a man who should not have been entrusted with the secret of its magical origin, and the family had to go back to the ordinary way of making buckwheat cakes. The Bible, too, gives a few examples of magical food supplies, similarly inexhaustible, the so-called manna from heaven. Moreover, stories narrated by actual people provide close parallels to this theme. Witness the following account, given by Edwin S. Hartland, a scholar of popular traditions, in his book The Science of Fairy Tales, a man who lived in a Stratfin Lay, in Brednockshire, going out one day to look after his cattle and sheep on the mountain, disappeared. In about three weeks, after search had seen made in vain for him and his wife had given him up for dead, he came home. His wife asked him where he had been for the last three weeks. Three weeks. Is it three weeks you call three hours? Said he. Pressed to say where he had been, he told her he had been playing his flute, which he usually took with him on the mountain, at the Lurfa, a spot near the Van Pool, when he was surrounded at a distance by little beings like men, who closed nearer and rearer to him until they became a very small circle. They sang and danced, and so affected him that he quite lost himself. They offered him some small cakes to eat, of which he partook, and he had never enjoyed himself so well in his life. Evans Wentz also has a few stories about the food from Fairyland, gathered during his trips through the Celtic countries in the first few years of the present century. John MacNeil of Barra, an old man who spoke no English, told Michael Buchanan, who translated the story from the Gaelic for Evans Wentz, a pretty tale about a girl who was taken by the gentry. The fairies, he said, took the girl into their dwelling and set her to work baking cakes. But no matter how much she took from the closet, there was always the same amount left on the shelf. And she had to keep baking and baking, until the old fairy man took pity on her and said, I am sure you are wearying of the time and thinking long of getting from our premises, and I will direct you to the means by which you can get your leave. Whatever remainder of meal falls from the cakes after being baked put into the meal closet and that will stimulate my wife to give you leave. Naturally, she did as directed and got away. John MacNeil, who was between 70 and 80 years old, gave no date to the story, but since he said he saw the girl after her experience, the event probably took place in the second part of the 19th century. Scientifically inclined people scoff at such stories with a very indignant air. A group of national UFO investigators, when contacted about the Eagle River incident, stated that they did not intend to analyze the cookies, plan no further action, and had much more important things to investigate. Two weeks after the sighting, Joe Simonton told a United Press International reporter that if it happened again, I don't think I'd tell anybody about it. And indeed, if flying saucers were devices used by a super-scientific civilization from space, we would expect them to be packed inside with electronic gadgetry, super radars, 
and a big computerized spying apparatus. But visitors in human shape, who breathe our air and zip around in flying kitchenettes, that is too much, Mr. Simonton. Visitors from the stars would not be human, or humanoid. They would not dare come here without receiving a polite invitation from our powerful radio telescopes. For several centuries, they would exchange highly scientific information with experts like Dr. Carl Sagan through exquisite circuitry and elaborate codes. And even if they did come here, surely they would land in Washington, D.C., where the President of the United States and the scientific ufologists would greet them. Presents would be exchanged. We would offer books on exobiology, and they would give us photographs of our solar system taken through space telescopes. But perforated, cardboard tasting, pancake-shaped buckwheat cakes. How terribly rural, Mr. Simonton. And yet, there is no question that Joe Simonton believes that he saw the flying saucer, the flameless grill, the three men. He gave them pure water, they gave him three pancakes. If we reflect on this very simple event, as the students of folklore have reflected on the stories quoted above, we cannot overlook one possibility, that the event at Eagle River did happen, and that it has the meaning of a simple, yet grandiose, ceremony. This latter theory was very well expressed by Hartland, when he said, about the exchange of food with the gentry, almost all over the earth, the right of hospitality has been held to confer obligations on its recipient, and to unite them by special ties to the giver. And even where the notion of hospitality does not enter, to join in a common meal has often been held to symbolize, if not to constitute, union of a very sacred kind. That such meaning is still attached to a common meal is readily seen at weddings and other traditional meetings where food is an important constituent, even if the symbolic value of such events is lost to most of our contemporaries. Hartland goes so far as to suggest that the custom of burying the dead with some food might bear some relationship to the widespread belief that one must have a supply of terrestrial food when one reaches the land beyond or forsake the earth entirely. And indeed, in ancient and recent tradition alike, the abode of our supernatural visitors is not always distinct from the world of the dead. This is a moot point, however, because the same applies to visitors from heaven. The theologians, who argue about the nature of angels, know it very well. But at least the idea of food provides another connection. In the light of Hartland's remarks about the right of hospitality, a passage from the Bible is noteworthy, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts, after that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do, as thou hast said. And he took butter, and milk, and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. And according to Genesis 19.3, Lot took the two angels he met at the gate of Sodom to his house and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. So, after all, Joe Simonton's account might be a modern illustration of that biblical recommendation, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. That is the end of Dimensions, a casebook of Alien Contact Part 3. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please proceed to Part 4, before YouTube deletes it. Thank you for listening.